right, so I'm going to do this in just text mode. I don't really have slides. My slides are text files, so I hope that's cool with you guys. And if it's not, you can leave. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm Paul Ivanov. Um, that's my uh, contact information, and I'll be talking about IPython. I, I thought I'd give you guys an overview. There was already some questions that were starting of how come I can, you know, CD in IPython, but that doesn't work in Python. I thought I'd give you guys an overview of what IPython gives you, and then get into sort of the structure of the different ways of using IPython, including the notebook and the Qt console, and just the console, um, and uh, go over that. And I have a little minor breakout that, that we can also do. So about myself, I'm a graduate student here. I'm getting to be a, a sort of a on the long side of graduate school. But uh, as far as the um, these tools, it's great to see 200 people here sort of joining the community. I think a lot of you are using these tools for the first time, and that's great. And this is just an overview of the of my contribution, sort of direct commit contributions. So uh, I do have uh, commit uh, rights to Matplotlib and IPython. Um, I also wrote a little thing called Vim IPython. If you're a Vim user, talk to me afterwards. Um, and so it's great to see all of you here. And so um, uh, I'll just move on. So there are many faces to IPython. And um, I'll just start off with everything that you can do within just the plain old IPython invocation. So if, you just, if you're just at a terminal and you just type in IPython, what you can do there, and so this is the this is the notebook that I'll go over, and then further on, there's there's some separation that we have. So so there's sort of the basic IPython shell, which you can use as a replacement for the Python shell, and you can also use it sort of as a replacement for your system shell, your your bash prompt or something like that, if you're familiar with Unix tools. Um, and I'll then I'll let you know what sort of separation makes it possible for you to run all of this over the notebook. And uh, so basically, there's a computational unit that's called the IPython kernel that's running all the stuff that you tell it to run. And you, you, we have different clients of talking down to those computational kernels. So one client is the, uh, you know, the notebook, the HTML notebook that allows you to talk to a kernel. But there's nothing stopping you from talking to the very same kernel using some local tools like a Qt console or a console. So that's sort of, that's the lay of the land. Um, and do uh, interrupt me if you have questions. About any of this. This is available in the GitHub repo. If you, it's up on the website. It's up on it's up on the website. I'm told. It's about Paul's intro. Paul's intro. Okay. So, um, what is IPython? So, primarily for up until basically the last uh, up until basically a year ago, IPython was just a single process program that, are, that acted like a Python interpreter, but gave you extra things. And those extra things, and we call it a Python shell on steroids. Um, you can do anything in the Python shell uh, inside the IPython shell, but you also get these nice things. You might have already seen hints of it, the in and out prompts that you can then refer back to. Um, you can also get shell integration, so you can actually call shell commands, such as cd, ls, cat, things like that. You get uh, introspection. So uh, Josh and others have already shown you how to do a question mark, how to do tab completion on your namespace. You also get non-blocking plotting. So if you just uh, invoke matplotlib from the Python interpreter itself, you will get a plot that comes up. Um, and it won't close and you don't get sort of execution of your program back until you close that window. And what IPython gives you is that when you pull up a plot, it gives you back the prompt. It gives you back the, uh, you know, the in prompt, so you can keep typing other things in that plot, but that, that uh, figure that popped out just sort of stays popped out. You don't get that for free in just using plain old Python. So if you, write, if you end up writing just plain old Python program, be aware of that, that's something that's one limitation that you would have not using IPython. And if, if you don't remember any anything from this talk at all, uh, just remember quick ref, so that we have these magic commands in IPython. That's one of the things that, that's the extensibility uh, that uh, IPython, the interactive Python shell, gives you to just the plain old Python shell. We call them magic commands. They usually start with a percent sign. Um, there are ways of 
invoking them without using the percent sign. So sometimes you can use them interchangeably depending on your, your settings. But basically, the percent quick ref thing is the thing is the go-to thing that where most of the things that I'll cover, cover today are in there, or at least hinted at. And then you can look at the individual help for each individual command to figure out what that is. But the quick ref is like, you know, there are things in the quick ref that I don't memorize, but I end up I know that it's there, so I can always look it up. And uh, as of the latest IPython release, the quick ref actually includes all of the possible magic commands. That didn't used to be the case. Uh, I think that may, might not be the case with uh, 12.1, which you got with EPD, but if, you ha if you're running uh, IPython 013, you'll get that. Okay, so let me, let's go over uh, this tutorial. So, okay, so, so we have here a pair, and a lot of these things that are things that you've already seen, but I've just written this so that you can rerun it afterward and know exactly what happened, but I'll just step you through it just so, so uh, we know what's going on. So the first thing I did, well, first, the, the sort of the, the candy is that I embedded that YouTube video using two lines of code inside of an IPython notebook, right? So you can imagine how cool that is for writing little tutorials or documentation for your, for your project, things like that. Um, even class assignments, so pedagogical, uh, pedagogically it's, it's a very nice tool to have. So this parrot um, is dead, it's a string. Um, these, uh, uh, so parrot is now an object, right? So I can do parrot.tab and it'll give me the, the methods that parrot can do, right? So I can, I can sort of, uh, after that, so say I select upper, then if I do a question mark, what pops up is the documentation for the method upper of the string object. Oh yeah, I should say that one of the reasons that I didn't do slides and I just did the text thing is because it just seemed like a shame to do a talk on the IPython, interactive Python prompt without having you guys code along. So if you, uh, um, you can also, the, the things that I'm doing here, you can also just do without a notebook. You, you don't, uh, you can, well, it's small enough you can type it out and you can just do it in just a plain old terminal. There's not, nothing except for the YouTube video in here it's specific to the notebook interface. Okay, so so the, then what, what does the upper method do? Well, it capitalizes that, so the parrot is dead. So then what you can also do, so the question, the one single question mark gets you the documentation of a given module or function or attribute. What happens when you do a double question mark, so I'm gonna import os.path, is that you actually get the full code of the module if it's a pure Python thing. If it's a C extension, if, 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 first of all, none of that makes, uh, none of what I'm about to say makes sense to you, don't worry about it, but if it's just a pure Python file and IPython has a way of getting to it, it'll, it'll put it in here. So you, you know, some people say, you know, the best documentation is the code, and it certainly helps that if whatever is documented doesn't actually work the way that it's advertised to just look at the code. So the double question mark gets you there, and you will need this for the breakout. So um, that's a useful tip. Okay, and so uh, what, what if you wanna know um, what things in my namespace have the, the, the string uh, pi in it? And with the string pot, uh, let me do this. All right, so so I just I just uh, uh, call the magic uh, for PyLab. PyLab is the thing that allows me to do Matplotlib uh, plotting in line, so that the images get generated and placed inside the web browser as opposed to popping up as figures. And it also imports things into the namespace. I think Josh uh, alluded to this earlier. And so now I want to know what in my namespace ends with the word pi. And so this is the, the sort of incantation that you would do is sort of star pi question mark. What are all the things that end with pi? And so there's a copy, an entropy, numpy, and spy methods that got imported that are in my namespace right now. And then similarly, so for this wildcard sort of lookup, um, what has pi anywhere in it, it's a lot more things like copyright and 
fast copy and transpose, things like that. So this is, this is when you know, you suspect what the name of some function might be, particularly if you're doing exploration and you've done an import, import star from some module, you might, uh, this w would be one way of exploring that and trying to find out what the different things in there, when you know a partial name or, or sort of different ways of calling it. So the peasant is going to be, I'm not dead yet, and uh, now I'm going to just switch to, to dealing with these in and out things. So you see these, this in prompt is actually something that I can refer back to in the future, and same with the out prompt. So peasant is an object, it gets returned to this out thing, so at any point later on, if I want to, if I want to get back this out 15, that's all I have to do is I just type in out 15, and the peasant will be, I'm not dead yet, right? I can also um, do these, um, access the in prompt, the, sorry, I'm the, this a little scatterbrained, I apologize. Okay, so the, the, there's, there's, two, there's another way of accessing all of the out things, which is just underscore then the number. So underscore 15 will be the same thing as just uh, 15, and so if I go back up here, if I had something else, so out six, right, that should be dead, so let's check that. That is dead, and, and that's the same as out six. So it's just a, it's just a convention, except that the nice thing that you get is uh, underscore six now, I can do dot and tab and complete on it, right? That's a string, and so I can do, have all the methods on there. So this is when you're doing data analysis and you have some intermediate result, and you're not sure if you're gonna need it around, and it turns out, yes, I do need it now, and you, you sort of scroll up to see where it was and find its number and then pull it back in. This is also a, a common sort of source of people think of as memory leaks, because Python does keep around all these extra objects, uh, IPython rather, does keep around all these objects that get returned. So people might say, well, my program is, you know, the memory is growing, and what, what if my computer is becoming slow? Yes, question. How did you get that pull down? Uh, the pull, I pushed tab. So I, I did uh, underscore six, dot, and then I did tab. Thank you for the question. All right, so, um, so this is for the out prompts. The same thing uh, exists for the in prompts. You can do uh, sort of, so let's do in 20, and that will be the string that I typed in here. And, and so it's not, it doesn't get formatted, right? So there's a new line character in there, and the U is just the Unicode. You don't need to worry about that. But if I were to print it, that's, that's the thing that, that got typed in, okay? Um, and similarly, there's an underscore way of accessing these. You just prefound an underscore i, and then uh, you can do uh, 20. And so that's the same. Yes, question? I'm not seeing out of my notebook. I'm seeing in, but not the outs. Is there a setting or something? Are you executing the lines as you're going through? Yeah. Uh, so the, the one, one reason why an out prompt might not appear is if you end it with a, a semicolon. Is that the case? Are you, what, what's the command that you're typing out? Uh, you shift enter. Oh, that's right, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, I, yeah. You shift enter, um, or uh, control, you can type things, and if you do control enter, it'll execute it and keep you at that same prompt. So you can do a print a one, enter, and then, you know, print two, and um, enter. Uh, control enter rather. Sorry, this has become such muscle memory. I'm sorry <laughs> that uh, sort of jumping around leap years ahead. Okay, I'll try to slow down and uh, actually make sense. Okay, so all, was already alluded to this who's uh, magic, which it tells you what the different things that you have defined in your namespace and uh, sort of some representation of, of those objects. And uh, there, whose is a magic, and there are many magics, and one magic that you might do is you, we want to reset the namespace. We want to get rid of all these things that, that we have lying around, and so this is uh, reset, 
And I, you have to pass it a minus F flag if it's invoked from the, um, from the notebook, because the notebook currently doesn't have a, a way of interacting in the, in the standard Python way. Uh, if you were to type in reset from a terminal IPython, then it would just prompt you, say, do you want to reset the whole namespace, yes or no? I can show that to you here. So, uh, so if A equals 10 and B equals uh, some string, uh, A, B, whose, it's there. If I do reset, it asks me, once deleted, variables will not be recovered. Do you want to proceed? You say yes. Uh, but what I'm doing from the notebook, because this prompt can't be answered in the notebook, so this is something to keep in mind, notebooks will uh, uh, may block on you and just say sort of be frozen because, or it'll, it'll, it actually will report a thing that we can't access standard in or some message like that. Uh, this, this would be the reason. And reset F just doesn't ask, it's just force, right? And how I found that out is, again, reset, question mark, and just read the, the documentation. Okay, so then I, I said that there's ways of interacting with your system shell. You, you, the way to do that is by doing an exclamation mark. So bang I Python minus minus version is, it'll actually go out and call that command on my machine, right? And so uh, just to show you that I'm not lying, you can do, uh, I don't know, this is just a file that's, that's on my file system and uh, I'm running the cat command on it, right? So, so you can just, run arbitrary commands, you know, if you had some foobar program, you could do that. The nice thing, though, about uh, IPython is not only can you do this, but you can also get the results of running commands back into your Python shell and into your Python namespace. So let's do that here with, uh, I set the variable v to be equal to the result of, the, of running the command IPython minus version. And so that becomes a list of strings in this case, and there was only one line uh, output from this thing, so, so it gave me that. Uh, now if I do uh, a listing in my current directory, there's a bunch of files in here, right, that I'm, I'm running and I'm gonna be showing you guys. And so I can grab those files from the ls command, okay? So what is, what is the type of files? It's the special object called an slist, which is a list derivative that also has these extra attributes that return the results as a list, or as a string joined by new lines, or as a string joined by spaces, or if, since these are files, it's a list of path objects, Python, uh, IPython path objects. Yes? I want a Windows machine and the LS command was... Um... That's right, so that's, that's, so in your case it would be dir, is the thing that you, that's right, so that LS is a Unix specific command, so on Windows that would be dir or something like that, but um, yeah, thank you. Front of that it seems to work without it as well. Uh, that's right. So for oh, so so there are some things that are common enough, like ls, that it also happens to be we make it as a magic or as an alias, so you don't have to put the bang out of, uh, in front of it. But some arbitrary command on your file system that that you wouldn't want to have a magic like a command called dd or something like that, or a command called man or whatever. Basically, an arbitrary command. If you put a bang in front of it, it'll get executed. Some commands already, the convenience commands like cd and uh, ls, we already created those for use because we use them frequently enough so that ls just also just works. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and you, there is absolutely a way of, for you to extend what things you want alias to. So if there's some particular directory you always find yourself, you know, cd to, you know, cd thesis, and it's like some long set of things, you can alias that so that you could just, you know, have a command called thesis, and then it'll cd you to that directory, and maybe even you know run some files or something like that. Yeah. Yes. So can, you show it not the can I show it not working with man? Without the bang. Oh, without the bang. Uh, yeah. So uh, if I were just type in ipython, it doesn't know that ipython is is a command because IPython is something that, that I execute in my terminal, right? IPython is like Chromium, right? I could, I could also, you know, I, I, could, I could type in here, you know, bang Firefox, and that will run the launch Firefox for me. Without it, it just, it tries to think of Firefox as an object, and it doesn't find it in the namespace. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So, um, so this is again LS, so files, we did that. So the, here's, here's the list of those files as a list, a, a list of strings. Then the, the, the list of files joined by a space and uh, joined by new line characters, depending on how you want it. Um, so there's also a, absolutely a way of using something that's in your Python namespace and put it back inside a shell command, right? So this is sort of variable interpolation. So in this case, I uh, uh, just to remind you, I have this v thing that is uh, 0.12.1. Uh, and so the zeroth element, it's a list, right? So the zeroth element of v is a string, right? And I'm going to call the split method on it and split on the character uh, period. And so that, that will return back a list of these things. And so now what I'm going to do is for each of those things in this list, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to print X just to let you guys know that it's there. And then I'm going to, I'm going to use, the, this isn't going to work on Windows again, but I'm going to use the Unix command touch that will just create a file uh, with the current timestamp with that name, right? So, and the way that I do that is X is something that, that's going to exist in, in the Python namespace but I'm gonna put it inside of the shell uh, uh, execution sort of context interpolated in there. So I'm gonna bang touch, and then the dollar sign X is the way that you get something from it. Because otherwise, if, if I just did touch X, it'll just create an X file, a file called X. But because I put in this dollar sign, it's gonna grab it, it's gonna try to grab it from the Python namespace and create a file that way, right? So this is why I said that some people actually use the IPython shell particularly on Windows, as a replacement for the system shell. Because you can do these sorts of things, and it's easier than doing sort of bash, um, bash scripting and things like that. So let's just uh, show how that works. And I'm going to ls again. And so now you see there's a, a file that got created that's 0, file that's 1, and file that's 12. Right? And I can also similarly do this again, just to remove those, uh, those uh, sort of extra files outside. And then they're not there. Okay. Again, I already said that uh, everything that's in here is also in Quick Ref. One nice uh, um, sort of uh, as a last uh, thing that I'm going to show you that's generic to across all of IPython is the the history magic. So the history magic shows you everything that you've done this session, but there are ways of specifying to the history magic that you want to go back a session or back two sessions. So by default, IPython just keeps storing the different sessions. So you might want to look at what you did, analysis you did sort of 10 days ago. There's, there's ways of doing that uh, with an IPython. And, and the way that you do that is that you read the documentation here, and then you, you grab some of these indentations. Okay. So as the last thing for, for this part, and I have about 10 minutes, is that right? Um, I'm gonna. I want to welcome you guys to the wonderful world of Python. Um, there is this Easter egg inside of Python. If you type in "import this," you'll get this nice little poem that you can uh, refer back to whenever you feel so inspired. Um, you will be using this in the breakout session as well. So, uh, and and the the one one weird neat thing about this is that if you try to import this again. Mysteriously, it doesn't, nothing happens. Okay? So I'll let, you, I'll let you figure that out once we get to it. Okay, so I've done this. Uh, one thing that I haven't shown you is how to do, um, how to run files and how to do some interactive debugging. So let me just quickly do that. So I'm here in a directory and I have one Python file that is called the uh, 01 underscore some file dot py. And the, the way that you just run it is you just use the run magic. So it happens to be that this is going to work for me. Uh, and that should have been an error. Oh, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't actually, so I'm sorry. So yeah, let me show you that it actually does something. So it's print, uh, hello class. Okay, so it's there. The reason that nothing happened is that I just have two functions defined in here, right? 
And so um, there was nothing for them to do. I never called one of them. I just defined some functions and uh, didn't call any of them, okay? But if I were to, uh, uh, to now include, so now we have hello class, and now let's, to the end of this event, I'm gonna call the, the, the function foo. Let's just take a look at what that, that's gonna do. Function foo, here's a stock string. It's gonna define an S, an A, and then for the B, it's gonna call the function B. When it does that, you'll see that it defines A as zero, and then it does a divide by zero, so that this is gonna be a bug in our code that's gonna blow up when we try to call it, okay? What that looks like in IPython, any questions there? That, that, that's clear? Sorry that I'm uh, sort of uh, jumping around, let me do that. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, run some file again, and oh no, zero division error, and you'll see that unlike the plain old Python uh, terminal, uh, rather Python interpreter, which would have just given you the zero division error, it doesn't give you the tr stack trace. We give you the stack trace, and we give you these colors, right? And if you act now, we'll give you debugging. <laughs> so you just type in debug, and now I am, uh, where am I? So this is, in, this is the Python debugger. Uh, L is a command that allows me to give a listing of where I am in the file. So I see that I'm on line 15, so this is where the bug is. Uh, I see that ah, a is equal to zero, and but how did I get to bar, right? And so if you do u, you go up uh, the stack call. So that, remember how we how we got here is that we first called foo here, so we entered into here. We went down, 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 executed these things. Then we called bar, went down, down, executed these things. This is where the bug happened. So now I can get back sort of the stack trace that has bar at the top. And then if I go up the stack, then I can get back to foo. And if I go up again, then I'll get back to the original line, right, line 18, where I called the, the, the foo command, the, the foo function. Okay, so, so that's debugging for you. And um, there's a way, I, uh, when I ran it here, it by default didn't invoke me into the debugger. There's a PDB magic that you can toggle on and off so that it automatically invokes the debugger when there's an error. So now if I run it, it'll go straight into the debugger, right? And I, I know that because there's this IPDB prompt. It's no longer the you know, in and out prompt that you used to see. Pretty cool, right? No, not so much. <laughs> not impressed. I worked hours for this. <laughs> um, OK, so um, let's see. I have 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, what did I want to do? Okay, so, so uh, I, I already mentioned this PyLab mode. Um, so let, let me just show you what this looks like in plain old Python. So this is just, just sit back and, and, and relax and uh, look at the screen. So Python, if I do import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, if I do plt plot range 10, plt show, this is what I was talking about, right? So this is this is a fine plot that, that's produced by Matplotlib. I can pan it, I can move it around, things like that. But I don't, I can't type anything else here, right? And I can't do that until I close this. Then I get back the prompt, okay? In IPython, it'll do the same thing until you invoke this uh, PyLab mode. So PyLab is this magic uh, sort of thing that imports some things into the namespace so that PLT prompt no longer needs to happen. What, what I did was, this is a convention that we have in our, in our community to usually we import matplotlib plotting this way. Uh, I didn't need to do this in this case. It was already imported for me by invoking that uh, pyplot magic. Uh, and now if I do PLT plot range 10, you'll see that I get the out prompt back. So I can still interact with this, with this thing, but I get this thing, uh, I get back the prompt and I can keep going and say A equals 10 and so on. Okay? Uh, I showed you debug. Uh, the time of magic, you'll go over in the, in the, in the breakout, you can see that. Um, there is doc test mode, so by default, Python documentation has things that, that sort of let you know that something is a Python prompt type of thing that you can type with this thing, um, and by, by default, for a bad example of the two, we, we get rid of those. So if you go into the Python documentation that's 
live online on the web, and you copy paste something that has these caret prompts out in front of it, we'll, we actually strip them out for you when you paste them in. So that's nice. But if you really, if you want to write your documentation in such a way, you just do this uh, doc test, uh, doc test mode thing, and now you have the same thing. So you just get rid of these in and out things, and now I'll be able to copy paste things as I'm doing and uh, paste them into my documentation. So that's, that's a nice way of documenting your project in, in sort of a, in a standard way. Okay, uh, there is a paste magic, which sometimes it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a pain in the butt to copy paste long things of, uh, uh, around. And so, uh, let me turn off the doc test mode. Um, so there's this paste magic that actually allows you to, to paste things in from, so this might be something that I copy and then I paste it and it's not gonna work, of course, because I just copy pasted some random junk that isn't Python. Um, okay, and so I, I just have a couple of uh, minutes that, mm, I hesitate to do this. Okay, so just quickly, okay, so, so what I told you is everything that works in IPython. There is this thing, let me just show you what the organization is like. So the, there's the IPython kernel that can um, talk to and interact with multiple clients. One such client is the console. So everything that I'm, I'm writing on here is you just put IPython in front of it. There's Qt console, and then there's the notebook. Okay, so so the way the way this works is that you can you can start up go here uh, up over view. Okay, so the IPython kernel is the computational workhorse. It just allows you to start up its one sort of instance running instance that you can then connect to. The Qt console and the console is a way of connecting to that uh, to that kernel. And the way that works, so let me show you here. So I'm going to start up an IPython kernel here, and it gives me this string that to connect another client to this kernel, use this string, okay? And uh, if it's the last one that you launch, actually just existing is enough, okay? So now I'm gonna t type in IPython Qt console minus minus existing, and now I, I'm sort of live inside of this <coughs> kernel that I started up, okay? So this is A equals 10, a equals hello, okay, so that's one thing that I've done, right? So that's, I connected one client to it. I can also do, connect it in the terminal. So this is a Qt console, this is a Qt application, it has pull down menus, this isn't a regular terminal. In particular, if you type in a PyLab inline mode, then you can do, in here you, you get actually inline things, right? And you can also have a tabbed interface where I just started up a new kernel and a new kernel, and so just like a web browser. Okay. Uh, I can also do console existing, and this gets me to the the the, the this last pro kernel that I started up now has a equals thirty. So sorry if I'm jumping around. See, I defined it in here from this client, but you can see it in here from this client. The reason that this is important to know is that of the three, the notebook is one that you can't really do interactive debugging in, but the notebook, when you start up, a, when you open up a particular notebook, what it does is actually launches a kernel that if it's running locally or if you know how to connect to it, you can connect to it using these other things that can do debugging, okay? So you can, you can actually, when you, start up, uh, when you start up a notebook, so let me show you that. So this is a notebook that's running, there's a connect, Time? Yeah. Uh, there's a, when you don't mistype it, there's a connect info, connect info magic that actually gives you this information of how to connect to the kernel that this notebook is looking down on. So then you can use the Qt console or the console to connect up to it. So this is something that's very hard to find a concise uh, description of in the documentation. So I thought I'd give you this to let you know what's actually going on so that you understand what it means to, to have an IPython notebook running, how you can actually connect to it from, from the terminal or from a Qt console and interact with it uh, in a different manner. Okay? 
running out of time. Um, and I'll be around for the next three days. Uh, so if, if none of this made sense to you, or if only very little did, I'd be happy to tell you. So uh, this, this you can look up. Uh, again, one thing from the notebook, if you take away nothing else, is how to get the, uh, uh, the help for the shortcuts to come up. And that's just Control M, and then you press H. So Control M, H, Control M, H. And so that's, that gives you all the, the other things that I would have described here. And now we have uh, ways of uh, viewing. So these notebook files, these .ipynd containers, actually have code. They have markdown, as, as you see, right? So this is, this is sort of a description that I did. Here I had a heading. And here I'm including a URL to my website. Um, so that's markdown. Then there's code. And it also keeps around the images. So when you save a .ipynd file, it saves the complete state of your notebook at that time. So if somebody else opens it up on another, on another computer, or if you use our new notebook viewer interface and you put it out somewhere on the web, you'll be able to see everything that was done sort of nicely formatted without having to run anything, right? So that's, it's a way of like capturing state of your, of your progress of your research, whatever it is that you're working on. But we're linking to that uh, view of all the notebooks Great. Okay. Um, so um, I could go over the. Uh, I was going to intending to go over the notebook uh, notebooks that I included, but those are. I feel those are pretty self-explanatory. You guys can uh, can play with those on your own. And um, I just want to welcome you to the uh, Scientific Python community. Uh, I think it's great to have this many this many new users. It's very exciting. Uh, we work very hard on these tools, as you will find yourself working very hard on them because it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's better than writing your thesis in a lot of cases. <laughs> IPython, uh, just as an anecdote, because Fernando's not here, IPython started as Fernando Perez's thesis procrastination project. So, um, and uh, it's, 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 you know, you're gonna be following a long tradition of you know, graduate students procrastinating on their thesis if you uh, choose to work on these tools and contribute. There's a lot more of past presentations, videos, documentation, how to, how to subscribe to the mailing list to uh, connect to the IPython community, users of IPython. And uh, just to let you know, uh, uh, the way that our communities work is we sort of have overlapping but separate communities and that there's a separate mailing list for IPython there's a separate mailing list for Matplotlib. There's a separate mailing list for NumPy. But they're so, all sort of they all sort of interact, and you don't have to subscribe to all of them. But when you have a question, just try to direct yourself to the thing that makes the most sense for which tool you're having trouble with, and do ask questions because we we actively sort of support this because you know it makes our work last longer when there are, when there are actual users. Um, so yeah, take a look at the uh, breakout uh, notebook that got posted. I think. Um, and let me just show you what that looks like. Any no, questions? I didn't post, no, I didn't post the breakout. Yeah. Okay. So let me just show you. Okay. Uh, so this is the IPython notebook viewer. And what you can do here is you can paste the URL of some notebook that lives somewhere. And in this case, let me just uh, grab the raw version of the notebook that I checked in. There's a link to that. Okay. Okay. So, so here's the, the 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 breakout session that I wanted you to do. I wanted you to decode the secret message. Um, you, I want you to run the timing, uh, time it magic to see which is faster, range or X range, and then uh, to do you know range question mark and X range question mark to read the dots for why one is faster than the other. Uh, and then you can also, uh, if you're feeling adventurous, you can uh, dive into the configuration options for uh, IPython. I, you might have noticed that when I uh, start up my uh, IPython, I get this little thing, and that's probably not what you get. This is just a motivational thing that I've put in for myself. Um, but uh, you can sort of do this customization and add extra things. And uh, I think the example here that I included is how to make tab completion automatically show you all the underscore and double underscore things, um, which is the which used to be the way that that tab completion worked, and we find that usually those things are hidden away for a reason. So now we make you explicitly put in the underscore, but you can revert that behavior. So these are all sort of tools that that 
you can make your own and um, yeah, have fun. Happy hacking. Oh, a uh, commit is, uh, so we use version control, and so a commit is a patch to, so there's current state of IPython, the project, and I go in and I say, I want to make feature foo, right? And so feature foo ends up being a patch, a difference between what IPython looks like today and what my IPython looks like with the feature foo. And that, then when I, I make that commit, and then I make a pull request for IPython to, hey guys, take a look at this cool new feature, here's what the code is, here's what it does, and when that gets accepted in, then my, I, that means that I have a commit inside IPython. So there's a commit history for all these projects. And so you can go through and see uh, who's made how many commits. So I can, I can show you, um, in fact, the, the way that I did this. Um, so git short log. Uh, so git is the version control system. I think we'll, go, we'll be going over this. But you can see that Fernando Perez has by far the most, so now I'm just numbering how many commits were made. <coughs> Fernando Perez has by far the most commits to IPython. And then there's a graduate student here at Berkeley, uh, Min Reagan Kelly, that has the second most. Brian Granger, another core uh, contributor to IPython, professor at uh, Cal Poly, and a, a graduate student friend of Fernando Perez's has the next, and so, and so on. I'm somewhere, there I am. So I'm on, I'm on the map. Um, so yeah, so that's what a commit is. Any other questions? Cool, so have fun with the breakout. Or, or not? Are we? Are they doing a breakout? Are we moving on? Uh, ten minutes. Yeah, it's about a ten minute.